Facilities that make this program possible are provided by the City of Highland Park. Programs are produced independently by members of the community. The City of Highland Park is not affiliated with the following program or the producers of public access programming and is not responsible for the content. The following program does not reflect the opinions of the City of Highland Park. Hello and welcome to Conman's Current Events Roundtable. Our show is brought to you in part of the amazing Bluegrass Restaurant in Highland Park where they have the most delicious food and the really great service that we enjoyed today. And I also want to thank our director, Larry Beyer, who does an amazing job on, for my show and other shows that are brought to you. And our crew today that are also doing an amazing job are Pam Chill, Irv Walenka, and Julian Martinson that are on camera and, and, and uh, all the other jobs that are necessary to bring this show together. And now I want to introduce my, introduce my guest today is Esteban Carbaco, Carbacol. Carbajal. Carbajal. I'm going to get it right <laughs> one of these days from the North Suburban Legal Aid Clinic in Highland Park. And you are a John Marshall Law student and an accredited representation for the clinic. And I want to welcome you to well, our show. Thank, thank you. Thank you for being here. And today we're going to discuss immigration. And we're going to be doing immigration the right way. That means you're going to hear what really is happening on immigration and not just a, a talk show host thinking what immigration really is when we really got the real McCoy here that's really going to be talking about what immigration is and how people can get here and what they have to do to doc for documentation. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that, that people do not, our viewers really don't know about. And Esteban, I really want you to tell us a little bit, first of all, your job and your position in the clinic and the types of cases that you handle. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, well, I work at the North Suburban Legal Aid Clinic where we provide vital pro bono legal services to those in need in, in the area of immigra immigration, uh, domestic violence, and housing. And I work in the immigration law practice. I'm a Department of Justice accredited representative that allows me to represent people as an attorney, even though I'm not an attorney yet. Uh, and this program exists uh, specifically to allow people to have access to legal representation, uh, even though they, they may not be able to afford uh, an attorney. And, and there's two types of accreditation. There's partial and uh, full and I am one of 17 in the state who has full accreditation. That means that I can represent people up into uh, immigration court. So this is free for people that can't afford uh, to, to these expensive attorneys. Right. You know, and so do people know that you guys exist? Um, and, and is there, I know it's in Highland Park. Are, are there other, uh, in the other areas of Chicago, um, different groups that do this too, or is this the same group that does it through, throughout the Chicagoland area? Well, we just have one location. There are other uh, organizations, other pro bono organizations that offer uh, maybe similar uh, services than us. Uh, we started off very small in, in May 2015, uh, and since then we've just uh, expanded. That was this uh, year? Unbelievable. Uh, 20, 2015. Oh, 2015. I'm right. sorry. And um, so, how do people know that you guys are around? Is it just word of mouth, or do you do you go to different places to um, around the schools, around different churches, and you know uh, that to uh, to advocate to tell people that you are existing here? Yeah. So a lot of it is word of mouth. Uh, also, we create partnerships with other law firms and organizations to. Uh, create ed educational programs uh, in the community. And we go out and uh, do presentations for 
uh, people who may be undocumented, uh, people who may be in domestic violence situations. And uh, that's how we've been uh, spreading the word. And uh, over the past couple of years, we've expanded our, our area that we cover. Uh, we used to just focus on Highland Park Highwood, and now we've expanded to other areas of Southern Lake County. And we even cover parts of Northern Cook County as well. Interesting. Do you find that people, especially if they're undocumented, are they afraid to come to some of these services that it provide because they don't want, uh, they're, they're afraid that they're going to get turned in or something? You know, I mean, this would be a, a, safe, a really good place to start for them, but is there a fear, do you see, amongst people that are here illegally or they're undocumented that they're afraid to come to places that may help them? Many times that, that is uh, the situation. Uh, people might not understand that there are pro bono organizations that are, uh, their, their sole mission is to help people. And uh, they might be under the pressure that we have some type of connection to uh, immigration law enforcement and that whatever they tell us, uh, we turn over uh, to them. But um, you know, it's not very common. It, it is something that we have to think about. We're, there are some times we have to reassure these, these people that are coming, uh, maybe for the first time, to tell somebody about their undocumented status. Yeah, because I think, well, Chicago is a sanctuary city. Um, is being a sanctuary city, is it that people feel more secure in a sanctuary city? of coming forward or you know there's pro and cons about sanctuary cities you know those feel that criminals can come in and they're protected other people feel a sanctuary city is good for people that are undocumented and they could have some security here what is your uh, point what do you feel about that well i do uh, think that maybe being in a in a sanctuary city might provide some undocumented people with reassurance that they will not be turned over to uh, immigration authorities for something as simple as a minor traffic violation. And I think that's what sanctuary, the, the purpose of a sanctuary, sanctuary city was, not to protect uh, criminals, but not to detain uh, people who have families, who, who have no criminal history, and, and turn them over to immigration authorities. Correct, yeah, because I think we were talking at lunch today, the Bluegrass, that um, there was a, you know, a couple that came in from England, and they were, for, and they were visiting Canada, and they, driving through, they had a drive and got caught in the middle of something. Uh, they turned the wrong way and got into the United States, and they were captured immediately, and uh, They've been treated. Um, I know you're not, you haven't read about this. I, it just caught my eye a day or two ago, and they were caught in the middle, and they put uh, the, their baby and their the whole family in the in in a uh, some kind of a cell that was uh, I think it was cold. It was called um, what was the name? I think you mentioned the word for me. Uh, uh, well, th there is a detention center at the southern border. I don't know about the northern border, but there, there is a detention center in the southern border, and uh, it's been given the nickname as, as the fridge uh, for people who have passed it there because it's cold and they don't provide you with uh, a, a blanket. They just provide you with uh, some type of... Right, and they were like talking about sheet. the baby was cold, and, mm -hmm. you know, it just, you know, I was thinking about it. We don't realize, you know, I mean, this isn't just happening to... Immigrants is happening to other people as well, getting stuck in the middle of everything. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about some of the cases that you represent, you know, something a little personal so our viewers could kind of understand what really is happening. And then we could talk about how they can get documented and uh, everything else that we need to know. Sure. Uh, well, we, uh, like I mentioned before, we focus on family-based uh, residency. That's where citizen or resident wants to uh, petition their relative in order to come over. Um, we had uh, a case earlier this summer. A, a citizen uh, of the U.S. had his wife and son in, in Italy, and he went to the U.S. Embassy in, in Italy and asked them how he can bring his family over. And unfortunately, they didn't give him all the correct information 
Uh, he came in to the U.S. because he had to work and he figured being in the U.S. was going to speed up the process to bring his family over. He ended up finding us and uh, we were able to help him reunite with his family, uh, with now his two-year-old. How did you do that? When I, uh, you said that he went to the um, embassy, the Italian embassy? Uh, the U.S. embassy in Italy. Okay, the U.S. embassy in Italy, and they couldn't do what you guys did. How did, how did you end up being able to do that for them? You know, the, uh, um, the, um, uh, the legal aid, North Suburban Legal Aid Clinic in Highland Park, was able to do that, and the embassy, uh, U.S. embassy, wasn't able to do that. What did you do that was different? How did you were able to get the family back here? Yeah, well, uh, because we know the process well, and we can uh, give them legal advice, uh, we were able to um, guide them through the whole process. And, and at the embassy, they just gave them general information, and, and not a lot of uh, particular information that, that was important. For example, the wait times. They, they just told them, fill out this form, pay this much, and then uh, eventually they'll get an interview. But th there's a lot of uh, other steps that go in between. Uh, Can you guide us? G give us a guide. Sure. Is you're the, you know, um, you're sort of the maven of this, and um, I, I don't know anything about it. And if, you know, I, I did have a friend who was deported back to a very good friend of mine who was a a violinist, amazing violinist, and was sent back to Germany um, because of his status. And um, I would, I would really like to know some of the guidelines, you know, that I could possibly refer somebody to, and and, and have some knowledge, because most of us don't have the knowledge. You know, we have no idea what to do. If somebody came to me, I, I, I mean, I'm glad I found you through the director of our library. I didn't even know that your clinic existed, mm -hmm. and I live in the same area. So many of us don't even know that you're there. So give us some guidelines of how you would be able to do this. Well, in this particular case that I mentioned, the first step is submitting the petition for your relative. There's a $535 uh, processing fee. How much is that? $535. $535? Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and that goes for to start the ball rolling. Uh, to process the petition. Okay. Uh, and the money goes to? Uh, the petition is processed by U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. Okay. And so they will uh, process the case. That may take somewhere around seven months. Once they approve the case, they'll send it to the National Visa Center because uh, these relatives were trying to immigrate into the country. They needed that immigrant visa. Uh, maybe it'll take a couple months for them to exchange the case. Once it's at the National Visa Center, there are a couple of fees that you have to pay, uh, affidavit of support form that you need to submit to show that uh, the intending immigrant is not going to be a public charge, uh, send in civil documents, uh, do a background check. When you go to your interview, you uh, go over everything that was uh, in the application. Uh, and if you're approved, you get your visa. You come in, and then you're a lawful permanent resident. It just means it's a lawful status in the country. And they couldn't do that in, in Italy and the U.S. Embassy to give them direction like that? Unfortunately, they, they did not. A and this is a process that took uh, about a year. Okay. Uh, so I if he was going to depend on the, on the embassy to give him all this information, well, then you can imagine he who's going to be stuck in Italy for, for a year, going back and forth with them. And so how he came back within, what, how long did he come back? Uh, the whole process took maybe about a year. He, um, th this individual came to us uh, in the summer, uh, and then uh, just this, uh, the summer last year, uh, and just this summer, his to family was family. finally able to immigrate. Yeah, because years ago they used to come through, uh, immigrants used to come through, and my grandparents came through Ellis Island, and all they had was a, you know, they had a, pa I don't even know if they had a passport. They had something. They had papers. And there was always somebody that, uh, like a, somebody in the country, like in Chicago, if they came into Chicago, or, you know, they had to come through New York, because Ellis Island was in New York. And they had a paper that somebody was going to sponsor them. And mm -hmm. that's all they really needed. And yeah. they got through. And I think the whole thing was just getting to Ellis Island and, you know, Exactly, yeah. The immigration laws back then were a lot less restrictive. Uh, it's 
basically, would you explain? Uh, you show up at LS Island and you get processed and, and you get let in. Let in. And then uh, after that, the immigration laws largely changed where uh, you kind of need a connection to the country. You need that relative to petition you or, or, uh, or an employer. So why don't people come in that way instead of, um, you know, why don't they do that? You know, they, they come, you know, people do it more legally and then they, are, they, they don't have the problems. They, they do it legally, they get sponsored either by an employer, they get sponsored by a, um, a university if they're going to university, or they get sponsored by a family member, uh, say in the United States, everybody seems to have a, a family member in our country. And why don't they do it that way? Even if it's a year or a couple of years, why don't they do it that way? Because once you come in illegally, there's so much that you have to be afraid all the time that somebody's, uh, you know, watching, get deported, you end up, you know, in a, in a prison type thing like, uh, you know, even if it's not a complete type of prison, like a fridge type of thing. Why, why did they do that? Why don't they just, what is your feeling about this? Yeah, well, there, there could be many reasons. Uh, first one uh, could be just because they don't have that connection to the country. Maybe they don't have that relative or an employer. Uh, and, and even if, when an employer wants to petition you, uh, you need to meet certain uh, educational or skills requirements. Uh, the relative, uh, you know, if, if it's going to be a sibling that's going to petition you or a citizen and you're already an adult, we already mentioned the long wait times. So for someone from Mexico, it's going to be 20 years, uh, 20 years plus. But Mexico is 20 years, but then I think we talked about a little earlier, was it? England is what? Uh, that one in the same category as Mexico that's going to take maybe 20 years. Right now, it might be around six years. So that's half from England. It's like half the time. Yeah, like one third of the time. One third of the time. Yeah. And why? Why is? Why was? Why is that? Why is? I mean, you're our closest neighbors, which yeah. is about three and a half, four hours away. Yeah, it's just uh, the amount of people that are trying to immigrate from Mexico. There's a higher volume of people trying to immigrate from Mexico than England, so the government tries to balance that out. How do you feel about that? Well, uh, I think it's a large part of the problem of why people immigrate, because they want to be reunited with their family. They can't wait that long. Uh, other reasons why people come in and document because the process is so complicated. Uh, it's expensive. Uh, you know, this uh, case that I mentioned earlier about uh, the citizen who petitioned his family from Italy, uh, one of those cases may be around $2,000, uh, roughly, and that's without paying uh, an attorney. Uh, that's just filing fees. And that's uh, a lot of money. Right, and that might not be so much for somebody here, but when you convert it to a local currency of someone living abroad, that could be their uh, half, half a year's wage, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so the, having that connection to the country that will allow you to get into the process of immigrating uh, the cost, how complicated the, the process is, yeah. those are all obstacles that could maybe motivate someone to come in and document. Uh, another reason too, and we see this a lot more recently, is people are coming from areas that are experiencing a lot of conflict. Uh, that's where there, there's been an, an uptick in asylum applications. Uh, and asylum uh, law has become very restrictive recently. And before, all you had to do is present yourself uh, to someone at the border uh, to plead your case. Mm -hmm. and, and now they're not really letting those people come in. And now you have camps of people who are uh, fleeing uh, gang violence, uh, uh, other issues like domestic violence. And you're keeping them uh, in these uh, tent uh, cities uh, at the border uh, without the opportunity to get that uh, legal representation. Yeah, that's pretty hard. I mean, it, I mean, if you're sometimes getting stuck at the border in these holding places are worse than they're worse than what's going on in their own country. They're fleeing from something. They're going from the frying pan into the fire, basically, because right. there could be, you know, they're getting treated like you said in frigid type uh, tents that they don't have blankets. They don't have. You know, the, uh, you know, toilets and 
you know, you know, all kinds of things that are going on. Um, it, maybe the right food, the right medical care. I mean, I, I would think that maybe some of these people, if we could only get to these countries um, before people start fleeing out of it, and maybe the United, not only just the United States, but the United Nations, they should all come forward and help these countries out. So these people can't, you know, they can live a, a, a good life in their own country and be safe there. We need to help these people before they flee their country. Right. Because the holding places are, are I, I, I mean, I heard about these, you know. I, I, at first, you know, I thought, you know, because there's so many politics here, you don't know what to believe and what not to believe. And I heard this happening to some British citizens and, um, and, and, and they're in a holding facility and stuff like that with a little baby. Uh, it's very heart, it just tears out your heart. Yeah, it's a very uh, compli complicated situation, uh, immigration as a whole. Uh, yeah, these countries that people are fleeing from, they, they do need that assistance, right, to prop up their government and uh, help fight corruption and, and violence. Uh, yeah. But people aren't only fleeing because of that. Uh, there, there are also natural disasters, right? Uh, but it, it's a complicated situation that requires uh, a lot of thought, a lot of planning, uh, and not simple talking points. Right. And so your job, you, you have a big job at your clinic. Um, and because you, there's requirements to naturalize, um, what, what made you get involved in the nonprofit immigration work? Well, I myself in, uh, am a son of Mexican immigrants. Uh, my parents came from Apaseo Alto, Guanajuato. Uh, Mexico? Yes. And although uh, both of them have naturalized as U.S. citizens uh, many years ago, uh, growing up I was very conscious of uh, the obstacles that an immigrant can face uh, in this country. Uh, so, uh, growing up, I felt because uh, I shared a culture with uh, immigrants and I could speak the language, I, I kind of felt a, a sense of obligation to help those people, people that resem resembled my family. Yeah, and, peop and people that maybe had helped your parents, exactly. you know, and, but in those days it wasn't as complicated as it is now, but you see a lot of your people being um, really, uh, you know, hurt, you know, and um, you know they don't know what to do, and um, and and now this legal aid clinic. Are you going to continue when you get your uh, law degree? Um, are you going to go into a firm that represents immigrants? Are you going to stay in a clinic uh, type, or give your you know self certain days a week at clinic yeah. and pro bono? What are your thoughts? You know, as pretty soon you'll be an attorney, and what in about two years from now? Mm -hmm. Hopefully, hopefully uh, everything goes yes. goes as planned. Yeah, I I really like doing nonprofit work and helping those that that really need help. Uh, being able to afford an attorney is um, you know, it's it's put someone in in a great position to help themselves, and I, I like to help those individuals that might not be able to help the, to afford that attorney. Right. Uh, so I, I would definitely like to stay in, in the nonprofit sector uh, and, and stay at the legal aid clinic for, for many years. That, oh, that's that, my plan. That's good. Because some of the attorneys in these private law firms, I mean, um, my, my, a cousin of mine, she lost her husband and I gave her a lawyer and she, oh my God, she just charged her thousands of dollars continuously. And she is, you know, she's a single mom with a child with a disability. Mm -hmm. And it's very, you know, hard, you know. Exactly, and that's the kind of people that we want to help. Uh, we also help people from uh, who are victims of domestic violence. And there's a lot of intersection between our domestic violence practice and uh, immigration law practice. We'll have individuals who are victims of domestic violence and go see a domestic violence attorney at our clinic to get an order of protection so they can flee that, uh, that, uh, that situation, the, the abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to have, and we're going to be doing that on our show too. That's going to be one of our shows on domestic violence. So. It's a very important topic. Yes. And so we might help someone with uh, an order of protection, and then that person might be undocumented, 
and, and maybe we can help them really obtain some type of relief uh, because of that victimization. And do they get therapy? Do some of these people require some kind of uh, like therapy, you know, psychological therapy for... Uh, yeah, domestic violence, I mean, even, domestic abuse. Even trying to get into the country puts a lot of stress. And it isn't just we're talking, I mean, because you're, you're here not because of domestic violence today, but you're here because of people trying to get into, you know, legal documentation. And that puts a lot of stress on the person as well, and the families. It does, yeah. Uh, a lot of our clients are coming from areas of conflict and, and they've seen very harsh things. Uh, I had someone whose father was uh, hacked to death with a machete uh, in a Central American country. Uh, so she was trying to flee, flee that situation, protect herself. Uh, so you have instances uh, like that. Uh, and you also have uh, people who are living uh, under this constant anxiety that they, might sell, they themselves might be picked up by immigration authorities. There, there's a constantly talks of, of immigration raids, uh, or maybe not even uh, the undocumented individual uh, is going through that anxiety. It, it could be relatives, uh, mm -hmm. children who right. know that their parents are not here documented and, and living with that constant fear of uh, the parents going to be home when they come home from school. Yeah, that's, that's very difficult for children, and that's ha that has happened too. Mm -hmm. where children came home from school and the parents were already picked up. Yeah. And that must be very traumatic for a child. So they, when that happens, does your clinic provide any uh, resources for these children of the families that are left behind? Uh, we have partnerships with other organizations that might be better equipped to handle but this you kind have, of situation. But you know to refer, mm -hmm. you have good referrals. And um, we just have a little time left, but what is the most gratifying part of your job? Well, it's, uh, we have two minutes. Okay. <laughs> it's, uh, well, it's helping, helping people. Uh, maybe someone escaping a domestic violence situation and being able to get uh, lawful status finally after so many years uh, and not having uh, their undocumented status used as a weapon against them uh, by their abusive spouse or partner. Uh, helping people reunite with their families. Uh, someone who hasn't seen their, their son or daughter in so long or, or petitioning their